Hi, everybody, and welcome to the last part of our series on processing raw text. So we've covered both lowercasing and um, tokenization, just kind of basic R and Python differences. So we're going to keep working with that block set to finish out by showing you how to handle other issues that could arise. And so one issue that is like the bane of all text is encoding. And so I've labeled this removing symbols, but the issue is that <clears throat> sometimes the encoding can be problematic when you are trying to um, process text. So the symbols don't come through quite right. And so this is actually not removing the symbols, it's transferring encodings so that all of your words are in the same encoding. Okay. So sometimes things don't process process correctly or the machine just doesn't handle the accented characters very well because you don't have that downloaded or whatever the problem is. Okay. And we would like to normalize them into the language that you're processing in. So therefore, I could use the base R function um, that is conversion, but if you just want to strip them out. However, the string i package has a good replacement function that actually deals with the encoding issue rather than just deleting them. And so in this example, I'm showing you how, how this works. But remember, if you would like to do this on your text, you should change the string here from characters to clean text. Because otherwise, you are just looking at these particular characters. So remember, you use the same variable clean text throughout to continue to process your text. And this is just showing you how this function works. So let's say we have some accented characters here in one of our um, European languages or any language that uses umlauts. Okay. We're gonna load the string i library. Okay, and the function of string i trans general. What we wanna do is put in our characters or our clean text, whatever variable we're working with. And we're going to switch it to Latin ASCII. Okay. You could also switch it to UTF 8. I would argue that maybe UTF 8 is more um, traditional encoding, but for English, maybe I want to stick with Latin ASCII. And down at the bottom, we can see what's happened here. So it has converted those into more of an ASCII set of characters. All right. So to do that in Python, what we do is import Unicode data. And we can write a little function here because it's a kind of an unwieldy set of functions in Python to do this. And so if you're gonna do this a bunch of times, I'm gonna recommend that you write a function. I also wanted to show you how to write a function. So the first thing you do is you say def for define function. You put the name of your function here, which we've called it remove accented characters. And then in here, you put whatever arguments you expect that function to receive. And so we just expect it to expect some text. Okay, I could call this X, I could call this cheese, but this makes it clear what I'm supposed to do. So I'm supposed to put in some sort of text. Okay, we're gonna convert that text. <clears throat> so I could just type return and then this big, huge, long line, but either way. So we would say Unicode data dot normalize. Okay, so that is going to take whatever text that we're doing and normalize it. Okay. We're going to encode it into ASCII and then decode it into UTF-8. And so that will normalize the text basically into UTF-8 while sort of um, converting first into ASCII. If you want to keep everything into UTF-8, you can delete. You can just encode into UTF-8. But encoding and decoding, this particular one will, uh, will take off the, the special characters because they don't always work right. Okay. And as long as you're not trying to um, use, as long as you're not trying to print this out pretty from this code, that's fine. Because what we're doing is normalizing so that all like forms are the same. And so sometimes it comes through with the accents and sometimes it doesn't then we need them, the accents to go away, really. If the accents are a critical part of your analysis, obviously leave them in, just encode the whole thing into UTF-8 so it will read them properly. But for me, in this particular scenario, they're not so useful. So I'm just kind of stripping them out to make sure that all of my text has the same normalization. Because okay. generally at this point, I'm just trying to get like forms together 
so that I can perform some analysis later. But, and I'm not going to like need those accents. Okay, so we're not saying they're not important. We're just saying that for the purposes of this analysis, they're not necessary. Okay. All right. And so to, we would define our function and we'd run a function. So remove accented characters. And I just pulled over my R component. I should do this on clean text if I wanted to um, run this on my blog post. Remember, because it's printing, it's not saving. So we would do something like clean text equals remove accented characters, R dot characters, or clean text rather, sorry. <clears throat> um, the other thing is remember in the, one of the videos last week, I talked about sometimes when you're defining functions or running complex loops, anytime you have something that tabs over, sometimes R Studio um, does not interpolate that correctly. Remember, if you run the entire chunk, it does tend to work better, but always leave this extra line between a defining function or a loop so that it helps R know that you are done with that loop so it will run them properly. Otherwise, sometimes it'll tell you that it's not spaced over properly. Yep. Now, another issue that we could have is contractions. So contractions are tricky because they're often broken down in tokenization forms at the accent, or if we're doing part of speech tagging, this can also be broken down in a weird way. So sometimes you want to just go ahead and expand them to their full words, right? So instead of saying don't, you say do not. Okay. So contractions are shortened or combined forms. Don't, can't, ain't, y'all, those kinds of words. And so an example might be won't, which actually is will not. And they present issues in processing text because you have to account for these different combinations and it can cause you issues in some places. Um, many part of speech taggers handle them okay, it, but it's better if you don't have them. If you're doing sentiment analysis, that not is pretty important, so you don't wanna lose it. And there are some other places that it could present you some issues. <clears throat> so the best way to deal with this is there's a fairly well-known set of contractions. And so you could just have a lookup dictionary that maps the original contraction to its expanded form. So what we're gonna do is have a, a set of a list of all of these and just say, find this, replace it with that. I'm not sure sound familiar. That's our string replace all function in R. So these lists usually exist. We could also make our own special lexicon or add to the list that's there. So we figured out in a class recently that um, here's like any type of there is kind of function wasn't in the one that's in R. Definitely y'all is not in the one that's in R. So I could take the, the set I already have and add to it. Or if I have a special lexicon like slang, I could add to my contraction set to expand slang terms if that's what you wanted. So let's look at that. <clears throat> this is in the text clean library. And um, I, one thing that I have found <clears throat> because I own both a Mac and a Windows machine and several Linux servers is that the way that quotes are represented is sometimes problematic. And so I have learned the hard way to replace all single quotes that are these like sideways quotes that word loves to do these curly quotes with the straight up and down quotes. Okay, so this is replacing this little single quote with a straight up and down quote. Okay. And what that does is it just keeps us from having issues because it is trying to find, it is, you'll miss some of your contractions because um, the one that's available to replace is the straight up and down one. Maybe not necessary a lot of times, but never hurts because this is a, an error that you won't expect. Now the function here is replace contraction. It's pretty well mnemonically named. You put in your text, what contraction key you want. And so this is available in the lexicon package, which was installed as one of the other ones. And you can tell it to ignore case. So let's take a quick look at that lexicon. I'm in Python. And what it is, is it's a simple data frame in R of the contraction and its expansion. So 
uh, ain't apparently actually is in there, but we figured out the other day that y'all is not. So I could add to this lexicon by saving it. So I could say, okay, my temp lexicon for the moment is the original one. And then I'm going to add to it using our bind. I know I have the clackiest keyboard. So let's say y'all is you all. Now our lexicon has y'all, which I would write. <laughs> So you could add more to this. So we can start with the base one, figure out which ones are missing and add to it. So one of the other ones is someone noticed was here's. So here is. All right, now it's printing. So this isn't saving. So we'd want to say clean text equals replace contraction clean text. Now to do this in Python, ignore this right here. This is how you'd install it, but um, <clears throat> If you're using the server, you don't want to do that. So let's, let's look here. Um, what we want to do is import the contractions package. And then it's so easy. It's contractions.fix. <laughs> and so contractions.fix, and it will replace all those contractions. But we want to save it. So clean text equals contractions.fix. Now, another way to do this is to um, actually import and run a loop. So from contractions, import the dictionary. You can add things to the dictionary. We haven't talked a whole lot about Python dictionaries. And then we would loop over it and replace one at a time using the dot replace function. Okay. And so this is what we could also use sub from regular expressions. And so this is a nice way to do it if you want to add more. If you want to use the base package, dot fix is pretty easy. So real quick, let's look at that one. So from contractions, import contractions dictionary. And let's just print out that contractions dictionary. Now a dictionary is an, a unique type of thing in Python, right? That's kind of like a, um, a structured array. It's very similar to how um, JSON works. So you have a key value pair. And so you'll see them listed here like this. So the key here is I'm, we see this colon, here's the value for that key. And so a dictionary is a lot like a phone book where it has a value lookup. The, these keys cannot be, cannot um, duplicate. They can't be used more than once. Now the values can be anything. They can be a list, they can be a list of lists, they can be a single character, they can be a ton of stuff. But the keys themselves have to be unique. So key value pairs. And so it's essentially like our little data. We could convert this from a dictionary object in Python to a data frame. And it's essentially like a small special type of data frame where it has the key and the value. Now our data frame in R could have non-unique keys, which is not helpful. Um, so the nice thing about the Python version is it does force you to not use the same one twice. And then what we could do is for each contraction. So this one's an interesting loop. I can't run it because I don't have the text open, but it has two combinations. So for each contraction and expansion as a combination in the dictionary, okay, loop over that and replace. So the replace function here has the find and then replace. So find this, replace it with that. Now we had to say what both of these were because this contraction dictionary has pairs. So we're looping over the pairs this time. So instead of looping over one thing, we're looping over two, but together. So that's another way to do it. I think contractions.fix is a little bit easier, but you could add things to the dictionary and then loop over the dictionary. Next, so there's other issues about dealing with the way the text is structured. This section is obviously going to be quite optional. If you're dealing with Reddit or Twitch chat logs, this section is not worth your time. If you're dealing with formalized text, this will only fix a few things. So there's a sweet spot of like, this may be worth your trouble or may not be. Okay. So some incorrect text, well, it could be slang. 
that people are typing like they speak. So like, hey, with a bunch of Ys. It could be spelling. So misspelled hey. It could be stemming and limitization. Those are worth your time. We're gonna go over those one uh, each individually. And um, how do we handle these things? So first one, repeated characters. This is where regular expressions are very useful. And so let's say you have this, somebody written out finally. This would be useful on chat types of things that you didn't, you want to normalize. You want to make all of these into the same word, singular word form of finally. Well, we could do spring replace, spring, string replace all, right, on our text. And check out this pattern. It looks wild, okay. This says any alphanumeric character. So this is a special form of a dash Z. So any alphanumeric character that is repeated more than once. Okay, so notice that plus. So any character um, one or more times. Okay. What you wanna do is replace it with that character. So the slash slash one is a special, is it one or L? That is the definitely the hard thing. This is one. Okay, so the slash slash one here is a special instance that's kind of like a placeholder, like a, a variable that says any, any one of these characters one or more times. Okay. Replace it with that character. So it's going to replace the F, which comes up once, with an F. The I that comes up once with an I. And when we get to L, it's going to replace all of those L's with one L and all of those Y's with one Y, and we end up with finally. Okay, that's misspelled. But the, to the computer, does it matter? So finally is misspelled, but so what? Who cares? Because now they're all the same form of the word finally, and we can combine them together. So it's okay if you introduce spelling errors, unless you're trying to print something out here, um, because the computer doesn't really care if it's misspelled. It's just that now all of those finalies are misspelled in the same way. And that is the critical part. And then the next thing we do, we could spell check it and correct it back. Now that same code in Python looks different because of the way that is sort of required to do it, but it's very similar. Any alphanumeric character, one or more times. So it has that same placeholder, but in R we have to double escape. In Python, we do not. Okay. The R part right here indicates that it's gonna be a regular expression. And so we've got, um, sub here, sub this thing, any character repeated more than once with that character all by itself on our text. Okay. So we would put in our clean text here and run it through. Now on this blog post, I know I didn't do this, so I don't need it. And if I was spell checking something like Fox News, I wouldn't do this, but it's really handy if you're spell checking things where people are typing like Twitter. Okay. <clears throat> Now, spelling. <clears throat> spelling is often not worth your trouble, but I would like to show you how you could do it because sometimes it's worth your trouble. It's also very slow. And so I would say that you would need to decide if it is worth the time and effort that is required to do it, right? which is always a question when it comes to coding and putting things at scale. So spelling options vary a lot based on packages. We're going to use the ones I like the most, which is Hunspell for R and Text Blob for Python. Okay. And you definitely have to check what spelling options are being offered. Again, it does not matter if it's spelled properly for like you to read it, as long as it's mis it's correcting the same thing over and over again in a way that's consistent. The problem is <laughs> the options sometimes are wild. And so in one example, we were doing a, um, an example of a, a blog post about Tesla, Nikola Tesla. And in one package for R, it was Nikita Tell. And the other package, it was like Koala, Koala T. And so neither of those are right because Tesla's name is not misspelled. But as long as you understood that's what it was correcting to. But if you're a person and trying to interpret the output and you didn't know that that was what the spelling error had fixed it to, it would be very confusing. So always look at what this is doing. 
And so what I've done is I've written this and I wanna say thanks to Simon Dedine who helped me write this um, originally for a project was what we did is we created a, a set of steps here to help with the speed issue because otherwise it's quite slow. Now we're gonna run this on just a couple of words um, but you could do this on many words. Okay, and you don't have to have them tokenized either. You can do it on big, long strings of text. So what you do is you first come up with a list of the errors. So which words are misspelled? Well, I misspelled them all on purpose. So you say Huntspell. Huntspell checks, it tells you which words it thinks are misspelled. Huntspell suggest tells, comes up with what it thinks the answer should be. Okay. Now, what I've done is taken the list of spelling errors, okay, and I've unlisted them because Huntsville provides them to you in a list because you're running this maybe over multiple documents. And I said, okay, unlist all of those. Just made me one long, big list of vector of errors. And then I've also uniqued it. A unique means I'm not checking the same error over and over again. So one reason this can be really slow is if I check each word one at a time and the same word is consistently misspelled or it thinks it's misspelled over and over again, you're gonna check it over and over again. And that can be very slow. So instead, create yourself a unique list of words to check. The other cool thing is that there are dictionaries. Now I, on my machine, only have the English dictionaries downloaded, but they do have dictionaries outside of English. Huntspell is a very popular open source package that like, things like Firefox actually use to help with spell checking. So there are many other languages that you can download. So another reason I like to promote this package is that they, it's not just in English. So we've got our spelling suggestions. Now this part is just for demonstration <laughs> because I don't know that I would suggest always picking the first option, but as a very quick and efficient way to do this, where you, what you do is you take the spelling suggestions and you always pick their first suggestion. Okay. And why the first suggestion? Well, the suggestions are ordered by prob by, I think, Levenstein distance, which is how many different characters you have to change to get to that word and probability. And so we want to pick the word that is most probable, meaning it's the most frequent word that people use, or it is the most likely because it's the closest in, mis in spelling to it. Okay. And so what I'm doing is I'm saying, okay, with the, with the L apply function, run over this list because spelling suggestions are also a list and pick the first one from each list. That is very much a hack. It will run quickly. It will normalize everything in the same way, but maybe is not, depending on what you're trying to do, the best output. And so for a different project, what we did was we put these together and printed it out and went through and picked which one we thought was best by hand because it was a, a, a small project. Would I pick things by hand for a large data science thing that was running on millions of words of text? No, because that would be a lot of work. But for this, which was fairly, uh, you know, we we're still 1500 words. We had to check by hand, but that's a small number. So we checked them by hand and then uploaded that as our dictionary and basically what, did what we did for contractions. But in this scenario, I'm just gonna pick the first word. And now I have this as like a list of words to replace. I saw my list of errors and my list of words to replace. I'm gonna slap those together and make my own replacement dictionary. So what this does is it binds together our spelling errors and our suggestions into a data frame. So now we have a data frame that has spelling errors and suggestions. Cool, now it can replace. Well, if you have one big long string of text, here's a problem. Let's say someone misspelled the word the. If you're going to replace, sometimes the replacement is subsumed in an individual word. So let's say somebody misspelled at as T-A and it properly figured out where I should flip this. If you just do a find and replace um, across a big long string of text and tell it to replace every T-A with the word at, you are gonna mess up a lot of very properly spelled words like take. 
So what you want to do is say, okay, take this big long string of text, but only replace when there's a word boundary around that. So only replace when you find like white space, TA white space, as opposed to TA involved anywhere in, in the text. So the distinction here is that we're finding the, the words, we're kind of hacking together our tokenization. So we could tokenize the whole thing and then do this and then untokenize it, but that's extra work when we could just use regular expressions to find those white spaces. So an R that's slash slash B for boundary because it's got a space around it. And so we're saying, okay, the thing we're actually gonna look for is this pattern, this regular expression pattern where there's a boundary, the error, and then another boundary. Okay, so this is like a find and replace where you hit the space bar, typed what word you wanted and hit the space bar again. Okay. So now we have our, our regular expression to look for and this correction to make. And now it becomes a string replace all, but it's a string replace all with a reg X. Okay. So we put in our either word list or our clean text here. We say, find this pattern. I like this function a lot because it's very clear. Find this pattern, replace it with the spelling suggestion and vectorize all um, false returns it back into a, a set of, um, oh, I think it might be a list. Uh, no, it's just like a set, a set of strings. <clears throat> all right, so let's see what happened. These words misspelled. The first one we got back was the instead of these. Okay, the is one character away from these by removing, or from this option by removing the S. These is also one character away by adding the E. So we got equal Levin, what's called Levenstein distance, the number of changes you'd have to make. Which word's more probable? The, way more probable. So we picked we picked the first most probable closest Levenstein distance. So we got that one wrong, but the likelihood of this happening very often, we would hope would be small. Okay, words we got correctly, misspelled we got correctly. All right, so it's a lot of work in R, um, but it is actually more efficient than you think it'd be because we can control the number of um, times it checks. In Python, it's much faster. <clears throat> so if you're using Miniconda, you can install it this way. So in Python, it's much faster um, to run the code. Like the code itself is much quicker, but it is very slow. The text block package here is real slow, unfortunately, because you have to give it a tokenized list. Okay. So if you have 2 million words, that's going to take a long time to run. And so one of the key here is keys here is it has to be a tokenized list. Our clean text at the moment is not tokenized. I've shown you how to tokenize it, but it's not tokenized. And so what we want to do is import from text Bob, import word. We have a tokenized list here, just as our example list. If you give it a big long string, you will get single letters back. So be sure you're checking your stuff as you go here. And the way to do it is you do word on your token dot correct. So give me the correct option back for each word in our word list. Okay. So for each word in our word list, get me the answer back. And you'll see that we got the again, words and then dispelled, which is a, a very close neighbor, right? So Levenstein distance, right? It's still one different by changing the first letter. And text Bob here picked this one. So you will get slightly different answers depending on which word um, option you use. So let me show you the wrong thing. All right. So I'm gonna get rid of this so from text blob, blob import word. And so let's say you have a string here. This is one thing that students tend to do incorrectly because they're just cutting and pasting. So word token dot correct 
for word, oh, I'm sorry, for token in string. So let's run that and see what happens. Ah, so if you do not pre-tokenize your words, you're gonna get this back. Because remember on one big long string, it's interpretation of a loop or a slice is to do each individual character. And that's not what we want. We wanna do words, but you haven't told it how to do that. The simplest thing to do is to import NLTK and just plop that in right here. Is to pre-tokenize this. So we wanna do, this may be a little easier if I do um, string equals NLTK word tokenize on our string. And now we want it to give each word back individually. Okay. So um, I'm not sure if I did it right here, if that would work. Oh, I'd have to do it here, sorry. That would work. You just need this last piece to be iterable. Had a moment there. So NLTK.word tokenize on our string. So for each token, give us back the correct word. So be sure you're checking these things as you go. All right. So now that we've checked for spelling and for stimming, or for spelling and contractions and weird words and all this other crazy stuff that can happen, let's finish this out by talking about some of the tasks that we might be interested in. So we've been talking about stimming and limitization and I keep being like, I'll come back to it. Here we are. Okay, stimming. So remember that morphemes from the first week's lecture are the smallest unit of meaning. So things like cats have two morphemes, cat, which is a, an, a creature, and the S, which means more than one. And so you can think about affixes as different morphemes. So ED will transfer things into past tense, right? If you're in French, if you add the extra E, it's a feminine thing. And so stimming is a regular expression type procedure where you simply cut off the stem or the inflection on the words. So you say, take off all the ing's because that is a form of verb conjugation in English. Take off all of the s's because that means plurals. And so it's a hack at normalizing the words to their root form. Okay. So things like jumping, jumps, and jumped would all become jump because we're removing the ing the S and the ED. The biggest problem is that something like wings might actually become the letter W, depending on which package you're using, because the S and the ING got removed for plurals and for gerunds. I have had this happen to me. <laughs> this example is real. So stimming is problematic because it does not, it does help, it's fast, but it doesn't necessarily actually convert them all into the same form. So something like running becomes R-U-N-N because just the I-N-G got lopped off. Okay. Compare that to lemmatization instead, which is where I use a dictionary to look up the part of speech of the word, which should correspond to a specific root, which is called a lemma. Okay, so run is the lemma for running, ran, that's the only two I can come up with, <laughs> runs, right? Where jump is the lemma for jumping, jumped, and jumps. And so limitization is a slower procedure because we have to use a dictionary to look things up, but we do go to went correctly or went to go correctly. Now, the reason this is slow is because we have to look at the part of speech. The part of speech disambiguates what option it should be. So the wings is recognized a little wings is recognized as a noun and does not remove the ing, instead leaves it as wings singular, which is the root form for wings. So let's see what happens on those, some of those particular words. So wings, jumped, morning, and reading are all words that have some sort of affix. Sometimes it would be right, sometimes it would be wrong to remove them. Now I can use the TM package, which is one of the best when it comes to text processing in R. 
and the pot and the option is stem document. Okay. So for stem document, I could put in my word list or my clean text. Okay, it will take the whole text. I'm telling it's English. And so it actually converts wing, jump, mourn, hmm, instead of morning and red. Okay, so most of these are right. In Python, there's two options we could use, the Porter stemmer or the Lancaster stemmer. Okay, the Porter stemmer is sometimes now called the snowball stemmer. It's like changed and moved and updated, but it's basically the same thing. Two very popular stemmers. So we've got the same words. So from NLTK.stem, we've imported Porter stemmer and Lancaster stemmer. We do have to initialize them by kind of like telling them, here's our blank model we want to use. And we still have to give it a tokenized list. So big key here, just like in the last thing, we have to break the text down for it. So we do PS for porterstemmer.stem for each word in our word list. Okay, we get wing jump more in red. And we get the same thing for the Lancaster stemmer. There are subtle small differences, mainly um, in the exceptions, but for most of your high frequency words, um, not a whole lot of differences. So let's try limitization instead. There is no one good limitization package. I used to argue that tree tagger was the best option. It is a pain in the ass to set up and is quite slow. So I'd actually argue that UD pipe, which is a package I will show you when we do part of speech tagging is way better than tree tagger now. Um, also slow, but provides us much, uh, a whole lot of information. And so UD pipe is a, a pretty good one and has many languages. So we're gonna get by by using text stem and text stem has a couple of different dictionaries. And so I like it again, because it's not just in English. We're gonna use an English dictionary right now, but it like prints out right away that there are other languages. <laughs> so text stem and the function, scroll, 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 is limitize words. Uh, I do believe you can put in any uh, big long character string and it will do the tokenization for you. And check it out. Wing, jump, morning, red, those are all correct. And then I put in another one just to show you, I'm sorry, it's limitized strings if you're gonna give it a big string. Um, so my system keeps crashing, his crash yesterday, ours crashes daily. So a bunch of different versions of crash. And when we do limitized strings, it will take a string and return a string, which is quite nice. All right. Now let's look at limitization in Python. Unfortunately, that is through Spacey and it is, not slow, it's just like, it's just a lot of work <laughs> to get it out. <laughs> so what we do is we're just gonna write ourselves a little function so we can get it out easy. NLP, remember here is our spacey defined English language model. So it's defined earlier in a previous lecture. And so we say, okay, let's NLP the text. So it'll run part speech tagging, like everything. And then I'm gonna take an pull out just the limits. Okay. So we're, we talked about join before. So join will put together all these words back into one long string with a space between them. Okay, so it does add, introduce a space here, which is usually not a big deal. Now let's look at this bad boy. So I'm gonna start at the four because I find this easier. So for each word in my text, okay, I'm gonna do this. So for each word in my text, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna give back the lemma so this is the way you get the lemma out, not dot text, because dot text remembers the raw, the original word. Um, so we'll get the lemma if, so this actually has a, an if function in it, a question. If the lemma is not this pronoun thing, else give the word text. So give the lemma back if it's not this thing. If it's this thing, give back the original text. And so that just allows us to control for this. Sometimes this option occurs. So give the lemma back if the lemma is not pronoun, else give the word, the original word back. Yep, and then we get the same answer. So these are fairly good, they're not perfect. No dictionary is perfect really, but they're fairly good and fairly efficient speed-wise. Tree tagger, not efficient. 
not fast. <laughs> um, UD pipe, not fast, but very, uh, very good. Okay, then we'll look at UD pipe in the next lecture. Now on the stop words. So stemming and limitization depend on the task that you're interested in. Stemming very popular, especially for things, quick and dirty things like um, um, topic modeling, for example. Stop words are the glue of the sentence that hold the sentence together, but do not necessarily provide a lot of semantic information about meaning. The N, A of, but, now they do provide some meaning or we wouldn't use them, but they're not the main meaning makers of a sentence. That is left by the big four adjectives, nouns, adverbs, and verbs. So um, what we want is usually to remove them as unnecessary. Stop words are high frequency, meaning they occur a lot on purpose. Right? And so leaving in a lot of high frequency words can really mess up an analysis. So any type of analysis that deals with a, a vector space model, like latent semantic analysis, topics modeling, okay, or even cluster, you're gonna, those words are going to drown out and cause you issues. So you're either going to remove them in the analysis. Um, so like, for example, in LSA, you would tell it to, to unweight the high frequency words as not that useful, or you can pre-remove them. Now, if we're doing part of speech tagging, we need those words. They're very important. But if you're doing um, certain types of modeling, don't include those words. So all of these things here at the end are really dependent on the task. So there's no one data cleaning process. Another question students ask a lot. <laughs> Which language is better? I don't know. <laughs> Which process is correct? Depends. Okay. So as a good statistician, the answer is it depends. Um, my favorite is probably TM. There are a lot of ways to remove stop words. This is a like, very popular thing to add into packages, but TM is probably my favorite. Um, the smart stop words list is quite long. It's like 700 words in English. There's uh, If you do kind equals EN, it's a lot shorter. It's only like 100 words or so. Um, depends on what your favorite flavor is, but I'm just like printing them out here so you can see a couple of them. And the function is remove words, put in your um, sentence or your clean text here and tell it what to remove. And so you can see now I didn't save that limitization. So all the words are still here, but you can see how many of them are removed. I'd also probably argue that this pronoun should go, but that's my personal preference. Now in, um, in NLTK, this is a little bit, it's not harder. It's not as clean. So this is a complex loop exclusion, very similar to the loop that we ran for limitization. So I import the stop words package or the stop words component to the NLTK package. And this just prints them out. You don't actually have to run this. The set function in Python is like the unique function in R. And this just, this just shows me the list. So I don't actually have to run that, but instead, what I could run here is um, this giant loop. So let's start at the back. Oh, we'll start at the four. So we're actually doing the, this in a slightly different order. So give me each word uh, back for the words in my sentence. So I'm tokenizing it. So give me each word back in the word tokenized sentence. All right. If that word is not in our stop words list. So we don't have an else here. We just have one if. So give me each word back in my tokenized sentence if it's not on the stop words list. And I wrote that out of here. <clears throat> so same words, keeps. Notice keeps is different here. But that's only the main one. So. Let's bring all this together. There is no one correct normalization procedure. There are a lot of correct ways to do this and a lot of different orders you can do this in. And we're gonna practice this a lot. <laughs> so we're gonna do a, a, a sample together in class. And in the next set of lectures, we'll do more of this again. So this will not go away. You'll get more practice. You should examine the text at each step to determine if you've processed it appropriately. So um, 
you'll see like just print a little substring. So I'm gonna go back in these lecture notes here in just a minute and add just some examples of how to print out the substrings because um, you do wanna know what it's doing until you get comfortable with using these. And then otherwise you won't miss the fact that you've broken down your text all into individual letters. You would change work through these steps based on the task at hand. So for part of speech tagging, we would not remove the stop words. For topics modeling, we would. So let's do a summary of all of these two weeks together. In this lecture, what have we learned? Well, text is really messy and we have to work to clean it up. Slicing and calling parts of the variables in each language. Remember, Python is a zero indexing language. So we have to start with zero. It also does not do the same type of counting that R does. So if you say zero colon 100, you're gonna get the first item up to, but not including the 101th item, okay? because remember it starts with zero. <laughs> the other main um, difference with Python is the interpretation of slicing on a single character or a single string. It will break that string down by characters, R will not. We talked about word tokenization and sentence tokenization, okay, breaking this apart down into its component constituents. We talked about regular expressions quite a bit and how that has occurred. So one thing I want you to notice is that while we, we did regular expressions like kind of at the beginning, those have made a reappearance throughout the lecture in many places. And we've talked about removing symbols. And from this, um, it's just, Sometimes characters get eaten too. They're just not the, like something happened, right? The translation or the encoding didn't work properly. So we just want to convert them or take them out because sometimes they turn into what are called, <clears throat> excuse me, bad bytes. So you will see this bad byte error every once in a while. And that means you have something in there that it does not like. And an encoding um, stripper will normally solve that problem. Not always, but normally. Contractions. Contractions, we can decide if we want to keep them or not. Um, I generally tell people to really focus on contractions in any type of sentiment analysis because many of our contractions involve the word not and not is a key component to a sentiment analysis. Spelling and chat type issues, I really lean away from doing spell checking unless it's absolutely necessary because it is quite slow, quite arduous to get it to be accurate and maybe not always worth the time and effort, but we've shown you how to do it. And then, oh, sorry, stemming and limitization together. So stemming is the quick and dirty way to normalize all of your forms together. It's not perfect, but it is efficient. Limitization is a better way to combine forms, but it is slower. So it just depends on which one you want. No one system is perfect there. Many people choose stemming. Um, I think with the newer packages, the limitization is better, but it is still quite slow if it's good. We talked about stop words, whether or not you want to remove those. Now you could go half and half. So for a sentiment analysis, you could take out stop words, but leave in the no's. Because uh, no and not are stop words. And then we brought this all together. So one thing we'll do together in class is work through an example of translating a blog text. Um, and keeping it all together in one, in an order that, that makes some sense. Um, and seeing what our errors are, I'm being able to compare the R and Python stuff. So which one would I say is best? It depends. I'm generally more comfortable in R, but I do think the Python um, has some winners for the efficiency in the code of how many lines of code it takes, um, but, I think some of the regular expression options in R are much more well-defined than in Python, right? So it just depends also on your skill set and your abilities, which one you're more comfortable with. Okay? I've had students that are, that are on both sides of the fence here. Um, but the nice thing about doing this in Markdown is that we can switch, we can mix and match. So you could do half Python, half R, or um, all R up to a certain point and switch to Python. So you can actually uh, leverage your skill set on both in these types of analyses. Okay, so we'll do that together in class. But for everyone who's just watching this video, you can go and look at the class example. <laughs> and then the next video that'll come up, it'll be for part of speech tagging. And so we'll take two weeks and talk about um, 
traditional part of speech taggers and then the newer systems of part of speech tagging.